Okay, so I'm just going to start off by saying if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, just raise your hand. Um, no problem, I'll answer it. Okay, so I'm going to be going through two papers today. This is the first one. Um, it's called Neural Decoding of Visual Imagery During Sleep, which can also be said as reading dreams during sleep with high-tech machines. And then the second paper I'll be going over is Induction of Self-Awareness in Dreams Through Frontal Low Current Stimulation of Gam Activity, which can also be explained as can zapping someone's brain cause them to lucid dream. Okay, let's get started. So I'm going to start off with some background on sleep, for those of you who don't know. So here are brain waves of your brain while you sleep. And this is all tracked with an EEG, which is what that picture is. It just goes on your head and it can figure out, it can track the brain waves. And so on the very top, that's what your brain wave looks like when you're awake. And those are alpha waves. And then so sleep stage one, that's your hypergonic stage. And that's when you're just getting into your sleep, you're floating around kind of in your dream. And that's what this study is gonna be studying, sleep stage one. And then this is just interesting. This is a sleep spindle. This is in sleep stage one. And that's kind of when you twitch during your dream. I don't know if that's, any of you can relate to that, but that happens. Um, and then these are unimportant for right now. It's just another part of your, your, your sleep cycle. And then in REM sleep, that's your deepest sleep. That's your rapid eye movement sleep. And what's important here is that uh, it looks very similar to your brain wave when you're awake. So your brain is very active. That's when you're going through your day in your head. Um, so those are your brain waves. And those, those don't just go through once throughout your sleep. It's a sleep cycle. So you start awake and then you go through stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And then you go into REM sleep and then it cycles back around. So this red portion right here, that's what the uh, researchers will be talking about the dreams that go on during stage one. So, um, and also, dreaming occurs throughout your sleep. They previously thought that it occurred only during REM sleep, but it actually occurs during non-REM stages as well. Um, okay, so this should look pretty similar to the picture I just showed you previously. These are your sleep stages. So, the scientists had the, page, the subject go to sleep, and then this is throughout the night, this is through time. And once they hit sleep stage one, an um, MRI scanner scanned the activity in their brain, and then they were woken up and asked to give a verbal report on their dream. And then, so this is a learning decoder. This is what the scientists were, were trying to create through this experiment. So basically what they were doing was comparing the brain scan to the verbal report in order to train this decoder to predict someone's dreams, what they were dreaming about. So the end result of this study should be that they have a trained decoder, so they don't need the verbal report, they can just look at the brain scan and figure out what people were dreaming about. So I'm just gonna go through the procedure again in a little more simpler terms. So there's three subjects, and they're asked to go to sleep with an EEG, which is that cap that I showed you before, hooked up, and an MRI, and so, then the MRI is scanned when the subject is in stage two, stage one of sleep, and then they're woken up when this EEG signature is detected in the brain wave, so they know they're in stage one. And then the subjects are asked to immediately give a verbal report of what the, they dreamed about, and these words are mapped out in what's called a word net, so it's organized sort of like a tree so that the researchers can get a broader idea of what occurred throughout the dream, just from a couple words. And then afterwards, after the subjects are all awake, they look at an image with an MRI scan attached so that the, the researchers could look at the brain activity while they look at each image that they dreamed about throughout the night. They're called basin sets, these words that they reported verbally. So now I'm going to go through the decoding accuracy of those deco decoders. And so this, this is over time. This is 48 seconds, 0.5 to 
zero seconds represents the time that the subject was woken up. And this is the accuracy of the decoder. So the optimal point for the subjects to get woken up before, sorry, the optimal time for the subjects to get brain scanned before woken up was right about zero to 10 seconds before awakening. And that's really important because these researchers wanted to repeat this after all this was done with the decoders. And um, in order to do that, they wanted the optimal, optimal point to get the best read from the decoder. And so the difference real quick between these two lines is that uh, the darker one is representing their verbal report. So that's going to be more accurate because that's coming from their own words. And then the lower one is everything they visually saw throughout their dream. Yes? The two graphs. OK, so yeah, sorry, let me point that out. So this is the higher visual cortex. They're just different points in the, in the brain. So they just found that this one um, showed more active. Yeah. Um, so if the darker line is the accuracy of the verbal report, how, how is that actually evaluated? Um, ver like they gave their verbal report. Uh, sorry, I mean, like how, how do you check the accuracy of the verbal reports that they gave? It was, it was them comparing, sorry, it's like they looked at the brain scan and compared it to the verbal report and like correlation they saw with the different. Okay. Okay. So now these are the actual decoders. This might help you out a little bit. So this is a pairwise decoder. This is comparing one uh, synset pair, which is between two specific words. So let's say it's mail and car, and here this is. This is a diagram of your verbal report. So this is whether a word was present or not present throughout the dream. And then this is comparing it to your brain scan. And together, we're training what's called a pairwise decoder so that it could differentiate between whether a, the male or the car was present. Um, and then so multi-label decoder is made up of a bunch of these pairwise decoders in order to differenti differentiate between multiple base sense. So you can look at more than just two words, and it gives you a broader idea with what occurred throughout the dream. Um, and what's so important about multi-label decoding is that it shows you both the reported and unreported content. So it doesn't just show you what the person said that they saw. It's also, through the brain scan, what they, they physically saw in their dream. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Um, so if machines can decode our dreams, how can we control what we dream about? So now I'm going to go into lucid dreaming. What is lucid dreaming? When you become aware within your dream that you are actually dreaming. And sometimes you gain the ability to control the plot of your dream. Um, so this is just a quick picture just to give you an idea. This is uh, the activity in your brain when you're awake. This is while you're just dreaming regular non regularly non-lucid. And this is your brain while you're lucid dreaming. So your brain is really active throughout. You're basically awake within your dream, which is pretty cool. Um, so does anyone have any questions on that real quick? I'm actually curious. Raise your hand if you have a lucid dream you know that you have? All right. Um, does anyone like continuously lucid dream? No? Okay. Maybe you will after this. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so in this next study, they're trying to figure out what would be the optimal frequency to shock people into lucid dreaming. And they're trying to figure this out because um, they started to find that lucid dreaming can be used to treat uh, post-traumatic stress and night terrors, which is really, really something incredible that they've been able to do. So but lucid dreaming is really difficult to get into yourself. Um, it takes a lot of training, actually. So if they can shock people and get them to lucid dream just like that, that's really important. So they're trying to find the best frequency to do this. So, this, so I'm just going to go through the procedure real quick. 
there were 27 subjects with no lucid dreaming experience, and they had them sleep until 3 a.m. uninterrupted. And they were monitored using an EEG, which is the same thing I was talking about before, which scans the brain wave that shows you the brain wave. And then so at 3 a.m., something called TACS was applied. And basically what it does is it allows the researchers to induce a very specific frequency and shock the subject with the EEG. So the subject was given this frequency for 30 seconds. And then the subjects were woken up and asked to give a verbal report and rank the consciousness of their dream. So, okay, so this looks a little confusing at first, but I don't know if you remember from the beginning, but I told you that when you're awake, the, the wave, the brain wave is called an alpha wave. And so, so this is them sleeping regularly. And then right about here, they were shocked, they, the TACS was applied, so they were shocked. And this is while they're still asleep. This says awake, but they mean awake with, within your dream. So seeing the alpha waves, that's how they know that they went through lucid dreaming. So there's alpha waves, the, their brain is going through an alpha wave, which means that it's, it's very active. It's, it's the same as if you were awake. And, um, which is really cool. It proves that they were lucid dreaming. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, does anyone have questions on that? Yeah? That's a great question, and I'm gonna answer that next. She asked um, what's the op what was the optimal frequency. I'm gonna tell you that right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, they found, so first I'm just gonna go through what each of these mean real quick. So, Insight is them realizing that they were sleeping, and dissociation is the person taking on a third person perspective, and control is them controlling the plot of their dream. So what they found was 40 hertz and 25 were the most optimal. Um, 40, for some reason, they don't know why 25 was optimal for control, but the 240 was the best option. Um, so. are, are there any questions on this graph? Yeah. And that's just based on the reports that the that the dreamers gave after they were done. Yeah. yeah. And also those brain scans, like they could see the lucid dreaming. Yeah. Sorry, what's the vertical scale? I can't really read those words. Oh yeah, it's mean score. So it's just the score that they gave of their consciousness. <laughs> question. I think it was just throughout, but I can check that. Um, are there any more? Yeah? Within the alpha waves from the EEG, can the, can the researchers tell which sort of state of whether it was in the of dissociation or control? Um, sorry, the, so the EEG isn't um, giving off the alpha waves. Or when they, when they were reading the alpha waves? Right? Yeah, um, they, they can't tell. Uh, I think it was like one out of ten or so. But I can I'm gonna double check that because I'm not positive. Okay. All right. So some of you might be here because you want to learn how to lucid dream. So um, I actually have been pretty interested in this for a couple months, and I've been trying to train myself to lucid dream. And <laughs> it's it's partially because I get nightmares sometimes. And it's really good for helping you, actually, um, with nightmares. So number one, keep a dream journal. It's really important because it's, it's possible that one of you who didn't raise your hand earlier, you have lucid dream before, but you just didn't remember it in the morning. So you have to train yourself to remember after you wake up what you dreamed about. And OK, this is the most important. You have to ask yourself throughout the day if you're dreaming. I know it sounds crazy, but um, like you have to continuously ask yourself if you're dreaming throughout the day so that you can ask yourself while you're asleep. So every hour, for example, an alarm goes off on my phone and asks me if I'm dreaming. And I use these tests to determine if I'm dreaming or not.
so that in a dream, because dreams feel very real, um, I'll do the same. So <laughs> what you can do to realize if you're dreaming or not is, um, first of all, look at the time. So you can look at a clock, look away, look back, and if it changed, you're dreaming. Like if it changed a lot, not by a minute, obviously. Um, <laughs> Um, you could look at words, and in dreams, words aren't words don't really exist. It's like it's always a jumble of letters, so you can't read within your dream. So check for that. And then this is a really good method. So if you plug your nose like that, and then you breathe out, in real life you can't do that, but in your dream, air comes through your nose. It's, like really <laughs> it's weird. Okay, so other ways that I don't use, but I've heard work. You can draw on your hand instead of getting a reminder on your phone. You can, whenever you see the mark on your hand, you can ask yourself if you're dreaming. Um, flipping a light switch, that doesn't work when you're dreaming. And, okay, this isn't confirmed by me, but I heard that if you lean on a wall, you'll fall through it in a dream. Okay. <laughs> it's cool. Okay. Um, Okay, are there any questions on that real quick? Yeah. Did you succeed? I, I lucid dream once every week or two. I'm still working on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, they woke people up. They, they repeated it every five to six minutes. So they, oh, so I, didn't, I didn't mention this, sorry. Um, so they repeated this about 200 times for each person. Oh wait, I'm, repeat, I'm mixing up studies, hold on. Well, they were, okay, they repeated it a lot. And um, uh, when, when you're woken up right away, you remember immediately what you dreamed about. And if they didn't remember, then they would just uh, discard that study and try again. Any more about this? Um, so these are just some cool things. And I don't have time to go over it now, but if anyone found this presentation at all interesting, you can ask me about any of these things. It's actually pretty cool. So one thing is that researcher, researchers found that dreams include the emotional extremes from your day um, and create something new. Um, a man with a recurring nightmare for 30 years was able to defeat it after training to lucid dream. And uh, a scientist observed the neuron firing patterns in sleeping rats by listening to them. And that was actually really cool, so ask me about that one. <laughs> um, okay. So all in all, in the first studies, in the first studies, first study, researchers were able to create decoders that can predict someone's dreams. And this isn't just for the study, they're gonna continue this, they're going to use this for other studies in the future. So it's really incredible that they were able to create these decoders. Do you wanna tell um, what that looked like? The result, did you see it? Hmm? Did you see the result? What result? From that study? Yeah, they, they did it. Did you, but did you actually look at it? Look they, at they generated a movie. Oh, really? Yeah, they put, they put a cap on a person's brain, hooked it up to a computer, and it, like, it played a movie. Okay, I'll, okay you'll, you'll see that online. It's, it's on the Project A <laughs> we'll, site. We'll send that over. Okay. So 40 hertz was the optimal frequency for getting people a lucid dream, which is really good that they know this now because lucid dreaming can be used to help treat night terrors and post-traumatic stress disorder, which it's really incredible because um, it's something that hasn't been easy to treat, and so now by lucid dreaming, they can control their dream more. And, um, so, just like to thank a couple people real quick: the Journal Club team, Mr. D, Dr. Cilio. Thank you for your help, and a shout out to Claire because she worked with me last night when she was really tired. I appreciate it. So, are there any questions? Answer. Yes. Are there any consequences to lucid dreaming? I haven't found any yet. 
They, so this is what's interesting about this. Like researchers in the past have kind of run away from studying dreaming because it's very hard to study. Um, but recently they've started to started to study it more because they're finding that there is science to it. It's not random, obviously. Yeah. Do they find that the patients are more awake the next day after lucid dreaming? Like, does that affect how well rested they feel? Um, that's an interesting question that they probably should study, but they didn't mention it in the paper. Great, that's, that's one thing I was, like if sleep has a purpose, yeah. does lucid dreaming fulfill the same purpose, right? Like, yeah. Does memory consolidation happen during lucid dreaming? Mm -hmm. We're just forget everything every day. Well, I mean, lucid dreaming doesn't last throughout your whole sleep. Yeah. It's, um, for example, one time I fell asleep and I was really tired, it was about one o'clock, and then I had a lucid dream, and it felt like a really long time, and then I woke up and it was 1.15, so it's like, it's only a very small portion of your sleep, so I can imagine, I can't imagine that it affects it too much. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Imagine that they'd try and study the content of the dream more, like comparing it to their everyday life. That's what they didn't say what they were going to use it for, but I can imagine them using it for that. <laughs> 